Greetings, everybody. Hello, and welcome to another edition of Fab Gab. And for this Fab Gab, I have a guest on here who is an author and longtime journalist. And his name is Steve Matteo. Hello, Steve, and welcome to the show. We've talked to you before on different shows. Yep. Hi, Joe. It's great to Hi. be here. Thanks for thanks for coming. And uh, of course, like on Talk More Talk, we we talk to you. You have uh, another book on the Beatles, about twenty years old now, called Let It the Let It Be book. Let It Be. Yes, that book is uh, now exactly twenty years old. It's part of the thirty three and a third series. It was one of the first books in the series, and that series is it, the, the series itself is like twenty years old now. They have well over a hundred books in the series, and it's still going strong. Very nice. Also, you have a book on Bob Dylan. That was my first book. Yeah, first it's called one. Dylan. Yeah. Yep. And and what we're going to talk about here is the book that he has, uh, the most current one, right? It's called Act Naturally, The Beatles on Film. And he discusses, uh, talks a lot of little, little information, tidbits, things we might not have known. I know I found a couple of things. Uh, talking about the five films that the Beatles are, are known for, a Hard Day's Night, Help, Magical Mystery Tour, Yellow Submarine, and Let It Be. All right, I had to do that without even writing them down. I'm trying to... It's very good. It <laughs> Why don't you explain? I noticed in your name, you got Jacob Marley Vinyl in there. What, what's the deal? Well, as I explained to you off air before we jumped on here... I'm playing you know, dumb now. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, when I when I got into YouTube and the app and everything, you know, I never really knew what I was going to do with it other than watch videos. And so at the time, I, I had this funny notion that someday if I ever started my own record store, something you'd probably be good at, I would call the record store Jacob Marley Vinyl. Mm. <laughs> because I, I'm a big fan of Jacob Marley, you know. So yep. Yep. Um, I know that's silly and crazy and people are going to be watching this and they're going to go, Who's this Jacob Vinyl guy? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that explains it. And of course, you've told me you know that you've watched my channel um, and you know a lot of my uh, videos and stuff. So you must know, uh, you know, with me, Christmas is over, folks. Christmas is over, and no, no Christmas reminders. But uh, we'll make the exception here this time. Uh, well, thanks for, for doing for that. Steve. Every once in a while, we should just probably remind people they're not watching an interview with Jacob Vinyl. They're watching exactly. an interview with Steve Matteo. Steve Matteo. <laughs> it rhymes with patio. That's it. Exactly. Okay, that's how I remember it. Okay. Okay. Um, you know, today, of course, is to just get set the mood. It's about as we record this, it's about two ten PM in the East. And it was, of course, sixty years ago today that the Beatles came to America, February seventh. And I think they landed at, uh, between one and two o'clock or something like that. So this is right about the time. All the pandemonium was, was going on at this time, Steve. Isn't that a great time to do the interview? 60 yes, years. it's perfect. I think it was probably a lot colder that day than yeah. today. Today it's cold, but it's here in New York. It is, it's not a bad day. No, not bad at all. Sunny and everything. No, no snow on the ground a little bit. But uh, all right. Well, as far as the, the book goes, I think what, what I would, would start is basically uh, wanting to know about why you decided to do it. I mean, there's been, uh, I, I collect books. I got tons of books over there. I don't really recall a lot of movie books on the movies, maybe, you know, but why did you start it? Why'd you do it? Well, there have been some books that are just on all the films. There have been some that were on A Hard Day's Night, Magical Mystery Tour, but it's been a while. There really hasn't been any books for quite a long time that cover all of the books. And I felt that given that we've had all of these reissues of the films on uh, DVD, on Blu-ray, VHS, uh, the soundtracks have been reissued on CD and on vinyl, I thought it was a good time to do it. And then with the Get Back special coming out, it really, the timing really, it worked out perfectly. So, uh, you know, I mean, that's really, really the impetus. I mean, I'm just really interested too in this place where sort of music, you know, pop music or rock music meets film. It really interests me. And I got into it a little bit with the Let It Be book, but the Let It Be book is really more about the album. Mm -hmm. All right. So, um, of course, when we're talking about the, the beginnings of the, the Beatles in film, you know, they did everything else. So the Beatles have done it all. 
Uh, but uh, it was natural, I suppose, that when they were so popular that uh, to capitalize on their momentary popularity, who knew how long it would go, they wanted to have, uh, you know, a film about them. Can you give us, uh, you know, uh, details in, about that to start out with just how they started doing Beatles movies and what was the reason? Besides, I think that was part of it, what I said. Yes. I think Brian really just felt that this was another next step for them that that's what, you know, pop stars did, whether it was Elvis Presley or Cliff Richard, or even before that, you know, Frank Sinatra, Bing Crosby. So for him, it was just like a next step. And for United Artists, who were the people that signed them up, it made a lot of sense for them because they had a very strong soundtrack division and they wanted the soundtrack album. They wanted to get it out and, and get it out quickly before the Beatles fade away, like most other pop groups at that time, it was very sort of ephemeral. Here we are 60 years later, after they landed in America. And as I say recently, I think the Beatles are bigger than the Beatles these days. <laughs> you know, <laughs> well said. so that's, that was really the impetus. And I think that, you know, United Artists had no idea that it was going to become such an incredible film, and that the Beatles would have this sort of you know, this this history that would go on all through the 60s. And then even after the breakup, the sort of continued interest in the group. Yeah. So Brian, what he he negotiated with United Artists for three films, which I guess Hard Day's Night Help. And it turned out to be Yellow Submarine then. Right. No, no. Let it be. Actually, 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 let let it it be be. was the one. Right. What happened was, I guess, Magical Mystery Tour was, you know, that was never something that United Artists was going to consider because it was a, this 45 minute thing that ended up being shown on television. Yellow Submarine, initially, I think there was some interest, but then they felt like, you know, this is the Beatles really have no involvement in this thing. It's just, it's a kid's movie. Right. So they were involved, I think, to some degree with some sort of distribution of it, but it really wasn't going to be anything to fulfill the contract. And then it was, you know, it was Alan Klein who basically said, look, we've got this let it be this. We've got this get back stuff. Let's just get it out. Let's just get this movie out and let's get this album out. And then this fulfills the contract. And and then we're we're done here. You know, I mean, he was just trying to make as much money as he could out of the Beatles at that time. And whatever was sort of kind of laying around. I mean, once John said, you know, I want out. You know, I'm done. I want a divorce, I think was the words he used, Mm. but they all kept it quiet. I think, you know, Alan knew, you know, this Beatles thing, this is not going to last long. So, you know, I mean, he was the one to to come up with the what was called the Hey Jude album, you know, the red and the blue. I mean, he was the one to get these things out there. You know, he renegotiated, you know, the, this new deal for them. Well, you know, and you know all of this stuff. Yeah, and he course. actually, even though, he, you know, he's generally not a, a well-regarded character in the Beatles story, he did do those things. He, he have him to thank for the Hey Jude album, getting some money, and the Red and the Blue, really. It's something. Anyway. And let it be. I mean, really, it was him who really, like, <laughs> let's get this thing, let's get it out. We've got all this sitting there, you know, before these guys, you know, break up and, headed into four different wins. Let's, let's, let's do this. I mean, he was very much involved, if not directly in getting Phil Spector involved in, in producing, or as George Martin said, overproducing the let it be album. Now, uh, we touched on Yellow Submarine a little bit. I just want to talk about, you know, the end clip everybody likes where the Beatles make an appearance. They did do that. How did that come about that they decided to be at the end? Well, I mean, a lot of the idea originally that was, you know, so good about Yellow Submarine for the Beatles was they were not going to have to get involved in it. And it was something that would happen and their involvement was minimal. And they were only going to give four new songs. And these were songs that were not going to be the sort of A or even B list songs that they were working on. And the people that produced it were the same people that produced the, the Beatle cartoons which were only shown in America. The Beatles didn't want them shown in the UK. And the Beatles hated those cartoons for a variety of obvious reasons. (laughs) But then when they saw what Yellow Submarine was going to look like, 
they were really excited about it. And they almost regretted that they weren't going to be more involved. And so they did do this little sort of thing at the end, this kind of tacked on the end bit. Mm -hmm. And what about some now things I remember hearing over the decades, film projects, I don't know how many of them were rumors that maybe they were going to do. We talk about, I remember hearing about a Western, uh, a talent for loving what, what title goes in my mind and Lord of the Rings and all this kind of, what, what about all that stuff? Yes. And this is, as you know, is detailed in, in depth in the book. I talk a lot about these films that could have been, and I mean, it's, it's hard to sort of nail down exactly how much of it was just talk or how much of it was negotiating back and forth and it never happened. I mean, the, the, the one you referred to, A Talent for Loving, is a Western. And it did get made. I believe I, I, think, I always forget if it's Lee okay. Marvin. I think it's Lee Marvin who ends up starring in it. And, you know, the, Ringo is a big fan of Westerns. I think George to some degree. But it never, it never happened. I'm so glad. And they did want to do Lord of the Rings. I mean, they definitely wanted to do it. But from the research that I uncovered is uh, J.R. Tolkien did not want them to do it. He felt that they were just a bunch of drugged out hippies and he didn't want them anywhere near the Lord of the Rings, you know, which is so fascinating to, to think. Now, later, flash, flash forward, flash forward to how many years and the guy who finally brought a Lord of the Rings to the screen, you know, live action version of it ends up being the guy who goes back and looks at all the let it be and get back material and makes the get back <laughs> series for Disney, who the people who made yellow submarine, the people who made yellow submarine hated the Disney films and wanted it to be anything, but, and it's, it's always strange how these different things are either connected or conflict with each other or how things change through the years that you know, amazing. so it's it's kind of interesting. There was a Lord of the Rings. The first one that was actually done was animated, and it was done by Ralph Bakshi. And I interviewed him for the book uh, to get his take on things. And he did Fritz the Cat. He was one of the first people to sort of do adult animation, you know, full-length animated films for adults. Some of them were very adult films, too, <laughs> to mm -hmm. say the least, mm -hmm. you know, he, it's funny. He also, he worked with the Rolling Stones quite a bit and he actually wanted to get the Beatles to voice the characters for the animated uh, Lord of the Rings that he did. Now, I don't know how far that actually went in him pursuing it, but he told me that, you know, that's what he wanted to do. So it was great to get to interview him because he was, he was definitely someone who was, you know, an interesting person in terms of how all this stuff happened or didn't happen. Oh, okay. I'm just thinking things are running through my head. Like I'm thinking uh, Paul was, wasn't he asked to, to play Romeo and, and by his own? Uh, I forget who did the film and he, he well, I'd heard that he, I think he declined. I forget the, what film it okay. was. You mean, are you talking about, the the Romeo and Jul Juliet that Juliet came Romeo out in the sixties yeah, in the sixties yeah, with yeah. the Franco Zeffirelli film yes right oh I didn't know that <laughs> yeah, the, but... char the characters that played the, the two characters that played um, for Romeo and Juliet in that film were very young much younger yeah, than Paul yeah yeah I remember Paul uh, what was that sixty nine ish or something like that uh, yeah, yeah or sixty eight sixty nine somewhere like in that. there yeah yeah I. I remember him in an interview talking about that, and I was like, I didn't know that until I heard him saying it. I see. Yeah, I never but, knew that. That's that a, yeah, I figured it's a great... movie, movie related. So it's, there's this. You could start part two of your book. And yes. Talk about there's that. There's so much of that, that. You know, it's amazing. I mean, I, I there's a certain amount that I knew going into writing the book, and then there's all of this stuff. Obviously, you learn as you're researching. But since the book has come out, you know, doing interviews, doing things like this, I'm still learning more things. It's always still, the way. Yeah. Well, even with my channel, you know, people say, oh, you know so much about the Beatles. I say, no, I don't. I said, I, and I always say, I know more than some and not as much as others. And I'm learning yep, every yep, day, yep. every day, you know. So, OK, now when we talk about the Beatles, let's go back to when they're first going to be getting into the films and everything. And, uh, you know, and the first one was A Hard Day's Night, as it turned out. Um, the Beatles were, were weary, weren't they? Because there were there were a lot of pretty bad 
rock and roll movies out there. And uh, can you elaborate on that? I know they weren't thrilled at first with the idea of what, what kind of story would they get or whatever. I mean, these films were always, you know, the Elvis Presley films or Cliff Richard or whoever. They were always sort of, you know, they the band or the artist would show up in a scene singing or lip syncing or, you know, the band would be sort of part of the story. But it was always like that kind of thing, not yeah. where they were like playing themselves. And it was very much done in a sort of pseudo documentary style, you know, which is what Richard Lester wanted to do. You know, it was shot in black and white, very influenced by the French New Wave. You know, it's a very different kind of film. You know, there's things in it that at the time, you know, were very interesting and unique. You know, now we watch and these things have been going on in films for decades. But, you know, the, the, the whole level of sort of surrealism that's in the film, you know, when the Beatles are outside the train and then they go back in the train, like we know that yeah. that's not real, that's editing. Yeah. But like stuff like that wasn't common in a film like this. So it's, you know, it's very sort of anti-authority uh, kind of film. It's very much reflects sort of the youth of, of England at that time, this sort of post-war baby boomers coming into their own, you know, the whole idea of the teenager and, you know, especially in England where there's everything is so sort of buttoned down and, you know, it's a place of such tradition and, you know, the, everything that happened in the 60s there is, is really an explosion. I mean, now it's all, you know, it's all been done. But at the time, it was very sort of revolutionary, but it was done with a sense of humor. You know, yeah. they were very cheeky. <laughs> yeah, their kind of humor, they, I think they started becoming comfortable knowing they were in good hands, I think. And then you had uh, Alan Owen uh, writing the screenplay, trying to get to know their personality, spending time with them. I, I think they started to trust these people, I, I think, a little bit more. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think they liked Richard Lester. You know, he style. was a really smart guy. Um, he was an American. He was a musician. He had worked with the Goons. He worked with Peter Sellers. So, you know, they felt this guy, you know, this is somebody that, you know, that we definitely want to work with, we're comfortable yeah. with. And you always see the... Some of the films that he, that Richard Lester was in, other things he was involved with reflect the Hard Day's Night, the style that would be in a Hard Day's Night and everything. So that's that that's right up their alley. So I think they they were in good hands. And Walter Shenson, uh, the producer, and everything. Um, you know, there there's so much, of course, that's been said about a Hard Day's Night. You know, and uh, I think I've seen you on a couple of interviews. One of them where you talked about a Hard Day's Night kind of extensively. Another one, I saw you discuss Magical Mystery Tour rather extensively. So I thought maybe <clears> take <throat> this a little bit differently even though today's not the anniversary of 64, not 65. I thought that maybe uh, uh, we talk a little bit about Help a little more because when people ask me, Joe, what's your favorite Beatles movie? I have a hard time because I think A Hard Day's Night and Help are both great. But I always give a little edge to Help just by a hair because it's just so wacky and so different color and all this wild stuff going on all right so if you want to hopefully we could go into a little bit of help sure um and where do we begin with help well first of all um this was going to be as you talk about in the book i noticed uh kind of inspired or take off of what was popular then the british spy film genre uh and uh you know james bond type of thing right now here's something that I didn't really know until I was looking at your book, okay? Uh, do you remember you talking about the initial plot of the movie that was abandoned? I didn't know this. Yes. On that. Yes. Yeah, th there was a... I, if, and again, you know, I, I, I wrote this book. I started writing this book. You know, now it's almost like we're getting on to five years ago. Almost. If you can't remember, you know? I'll tell you how... No, no, no. I can, I can, I can remember, just not, not every detail that's right. in the book, but... You know, I, the loose kind of story was something to the effect of Ringo would try to have himself kidnapped. OK, that, and there was apparently another film that was either it was already in production or it was just coming out that had a similar plot. And so they killed it. I think it's a Philip de Broca film, if you know his films, really interesting, very sort of stylish uh, European films. And uh, I, I think it was uh, Alan Delone or John Paul Belmondo 
might have been the star of it. I, I, I completely forget now. But um, so they kind of moved on from that. And it sort of becomes loosely based on a novel called The Moonstone. And it's, it's, a, it's an early novel. It goes back quite a while. Wilkie Collins. It's almost like Victorian era, I believe. And so it has elements of that in terms of the cult and the ring and, and some of the plot points. It's not based on it, but it borrows partially from it. You know, it's very much sort of, it's a hodgepodge in a lot of ways. It's a different screenwriter. It's not Alan Owen. And it's a different cinematographer who Richard Lester really loved the way it was photographed. He felt it was a breakthrough for photographing a color movie at the time. And it's interesting that you said you prefer help to a hard day's night because that's what Richard Lester said. Yes, he actually right, yeah. prefers it. Yeah, which is interesting. I don't know, maybe from a, a you know a film director's point of view, I don't know, more of challenging to him. I don't know, but yeah, he, I do remember him saying that. And of course, uh, <clears throat> like I said, the plot is completely crazy. The Beatles themselves... Uh, right, none of them did, were ever wild about that movie, uh, especially John. You know, wasn't he called it crap one time. It was no simple, <laughs> simple word. Uh, one two that says it. But I always felt bad that they didn't enjoy it. I wonder if Ringo maybe had a little bit more liking for it. He had more of a more to do in it, more of a part. But uh, <clears throat> so as far as uh, the locations, it took them to different places other than just being insane in London, right? Right. And that was influenced by the Bond films because yeah. that was a, a staple of the Bond films to go to these exotic locations because at the time, and I think I've said this in other interviews, you know, that one of the allures of the Bond films was people at that time, you know, the average Joe Mayo <laughs> didn't necessarily jump on an airplane every year or two and, go on a vacation to Europe or the Caribbean. It was still new, you know, commercial air travel and new and expensive. And so for people to go to the movies and to see these places, you know, like Istanbul in, in the Bond films or, you know, Jamaica or whatever the case may be. So that was the reason why it's filmed in the Bahamas and it's filmed in the Austrian Alps because yeah. it's, it's, it's a takeoff on that. Now, there, now people have also indicated that some of that was also it was a tax dodge, and that's partially why they did it too. That okay. the Bahamas became a, it was a, a, they were told if you go there, we can we can write off a certain amount of the taxes there if we if we mm -hmm. film there. So that was part of it. And I get into this and I get into this in detail in the book about that whole business tax shelter thing about it. You know, as, as you probably know, particularly at that time. People who earned a lot of money in England were taxed at some ridiculous amount, like nothing us Americans could ever imagine. I believe it's gotten better over the years. So they were always, you know, they were making a lot of money. So they were looking for ways of, you know, how can we protect ourselves? How can we hide some of this money? You know, and they weren't doing anything illegal. There was nothing illegal about it. But that was also part of the reason that they went to the Bahamas. Interesting. Now, of course, the Beatles at that time were heavily into pot. At that time, they never yes. made a, a secret of that. You know, the pleasures of tea. Yes. <laughs> yeah, tea. Yeah, <laughs> they've discussed that at at length. You know, and uh, I I don't know if I see that much evidence of it in the movie. But then again, <laughs> I've never indulged, believe it or not. So I don't know. But uh, what what could you talk about regarding that? Well, I mean, what you know, the, the research that, that I uncovered, and this is, I think, this is pretty common knowledge, is that Lester knew that they would start, you know, you know, partaking in the pleasures of tea pretty early in the day, <laughs> and so the key was to get them, you know, on set and start get. Let's get as much stuff in the can before they're completely useless to us, <laughs> you know. So that was a lot of what they did. It was just a practical matter, really. I think to. To, to Richard Lester and his crew. And then, of course, with this film, the, the whole cast is so much more of the film than a hard, in yeah. A Hard Day's Night. Yeah. You know, Clang and his whole gang and, you know, Foot and all of that, yeah. you know. So I guess they were, able to, they were able to make it work. I mean, they had a bigger budget, obviously. It took a lot longer to film. So 
they were able to make it work. I mean, I think that this was more of a problem in the Bahamas than it was once they got to Austria. Because in the Bahamas, it was very conducive to sort of, you know, you know, soon come on, you know. <laughs> so, um, I mean, I think that's where it was. It was definitely and they and they filmed they filmed in the in the Bahamas first and then they went to then they went to Austria. Yeah. And I was also thinking when I was reading it in, in your book, you have a lot. I mean, you, you talk about what they shot each day, you know, days this day, that day, which is interesting. But also, you know, you don't really think I mean, the Beatles, well, they were young at the time. But to think that they were recording the songs, the soundtrack first like in uh, earlier in february and then they went went to the bahamas like february 22nd or something and this and they were going to film i mean i guess when you're young you can do all that stuff but to me it's mind blowing oh you got to write the music you got to record the music you know re- record it and then you know then we go uh, and then film it's not like you know 3 months from now we're going you know have it ready record everything because we're, 3 months from now we're going to be there no it was the same month which which is it just blows me away how, how fast yeah. they were able to do these things and everything. But that's that, that was the Beatles for you. Yeah, I mean, they were young and they were very ambitious and they were sort of used to this being in constant motion. It was kind of how things were done. OK, it's time to go in the studio. It's time to go on tour. You know, it's time to go do a television appearance. It's time to make a film. It's time to do an interview. I mean, this was just their life. They were in this this continuous motion all the time and i think that you know with john and paul the the songs which just kept coming and just they just kept writing and writing and it's just this is such a rich period i think for them too you know we're sort of past beatlemania and we're not up to the psychedelic era so i think that they're writing these very sort of tight mid 60s pop songs in this period that are sort of so perfect I mean, it, 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 it's just extraordinary. They, I think they're really in their stride at this point. I mean, later, the music becomes deeper and the albums become sort of more conceptual. But I think in this period here, they're just, you know, you know, Ticket to Ride, you know, st- you know, stuff like that is just, it's so perfect. They're such perfect songs and they're just quick, pop, you know, perfect for the radio, for AM radio. And... You know, I mean, you know, their songs, obviously, they wrote that they just wrote that were going to be part of the film, regardless of what the songs were about. Mm -hmm. I think there were things that they wrote, like, obviously, you know, I think like the, 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 the theme song to some degree, you know, became more about what the movie was about. But it just all kind of it just all kind of works. I mean, I think this was this was a lot of what the Beatles did with A Hard Day's Night and Help, is they would have songs that maybe didn't really have anything very specific to do with the narrative or the plot of the film, but just kind of work and give you a sense of the personality of the group and get to see them in a, in a sort of these various performing sort of ways. So it was, it was all new. This was all very new. Yeah. I, I Going back for a minute, I'm thinking of the, the idea of the Beatles being stoned all the time, <laughs> to, to put it to put it straight, you know, stoned. They weren't straight. straight. <laughs> no, to put the, to put it straight, stoned, but they weren't straight. But uh, anyway, I, I just can't see that it blows my mind because to me, I, I would be so excited to be making a movie. Now, granted, already they they did a Hard Day's Night already, you know, not the first time. But uh, I'd be like, no, no, I want to be, I want to be on, you know, I want to I be able to really give a good performance. I want to do, I, I, I find that amazing that they just would like, you know, stumble their way through it, just laugh their way through it, giggle their way through it. I can't, even though it is a silly movie, but. It is a silly movie. I mean, I think as Austin Powers said, they were switched on, I think, you know, <laughs> I mean, that was the times. I mean, that's, I think it was part of the bubble that they created too, where they wanted to insulate themselves from the world because they were constantly being chased. They were constantly being pawed at and people wanted them and wanted their time, wanted to get to know them. And I think it, it, it was part of what sort of bonded them. You know, this was the time where these four guys were really thick as thieves. I mean, obviously, as we know later on, that would fray and they would, they would go in their own directions. But at this time, the tightness of these four guys, 
you know, like no one else knew what that was like. You know, George Harrison is, yeah. you know, he talked about this through the years. He said, no one knows what it was like to be one of those four guys. So mm -hmm. only the other three guys could, could really understand it. And yeah. I mean, I think that's a lot of what the success was too, of just of how tight they were. When, when the four of them were in a room, there was just nothing like it, people always said. If it was one or two or three, it was never the same when all four were in a room at the same time. Yeah, and Ringo often talked about that too and said about how they had the four of them, brothers and all this, and he felt sorry for Elvis. Elvis was like one guy, and this was four of them together. Well, only they knew the they could they could they could like lean on each other or one was getting a little too big headed or something the other ones could say hey you know keep it down to reality that kind of thing all right well let's talk about the title change a little bit because i was thinking you know of course some people have those 45s where it says from the motion picture eight arms to hold you <laughs> uh, which was going to be the title originally and that was supposed to be about the the statue of kylie right. Right. There were eight arms. Right. And the Beatles, the four guys, the Beatles, the four eight, Beatles. eight arms. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I guess the, the, the main thing was John and Paul was sort of like, well, you know, how are we going to write a song around that? Yeah. You know, and then they and then help was obviously already taken. But they realized that if they put an exclamation point after it, it changed it. And so that's that was very simple. That's what they did. And it's a great title for that movie. And uh, yeah. I, I remember now I'm thinking of, I think George saying that's a great title because in one of the interviews, there were all these interviews that are a lot of, a lot of, a lot of while they're making this movie, there's clips of them talking about it a lot. And I think George, it was, might have said, which is really a great title because all these people are trying to do all these things to us and, you know, trying to get us and everything. So, you know, that worked out good. Um, now, how about talking a little about, well, the cast, you know, beginning with, like, Leo McKern, who was, uh, he did comedy, but he did serious stuff, too. Yes, he did. He was a very versatile actor who had a career long before he was, he worked with the Beatles. I mean, a lot of these guys were, you know, and gals were pros. I mean, they had, they were people, and, and behind the scenes, too, you know, were people who had been making films in England who were definitely part of that community. And I mean, you know, you talk about Victor Spinetti. I mean, he's somebody that the Beatles just fell in love with. Oh, you know, yeah. They, they told friend. Victor, they said, we want you in every movie we make. <laughs> I mean, they were, they just adored him. And I mean, he was just this kind of person. And I think he just, everyone sort of just fell in love with Victor. You know, I mean, he's just one of these guys. I mean, he's so great. I mean, you know, he just, he's another one who kept on, doing things and making movies i mean he's in the he's in the prince film under the cherry moon i mean I to know. show you how long you know his career kind of kind of went on and i mean he's just he is just wonderful i mean he's just so great of, co of course like, not only a hard day's night in help but he was back in magical mystery tour as the yes the drill sergeant and then of course uh paul even used him right in uh the london town promo Yes, for that for that song, he's in there, makes an appearance in there. Yeah, yeah. So they they were fond of him. John later on, uh, I forget what the situation was. There's that great interview release that has Victor and John Lennon. Well, I forget what it was. It well, was his Victor's thing, and John right, was there. Yeah. What happened was, I I believe that Victor took one or more of John's books and turned it into a play. And that's that's what that was about. So that was, that's, that was the combination. Of the two yes, of that's what that's what that was about. I mean, he was a very creative, interesting guy. I mean, he's been funny. And I mean, you know, he some of these people are just they're sort of one of a kinds. I mean, I don't I don't think there's there's really any question about it. You know, well, in the movie, we have Roy Kinnear, who, again, you know, is all over the place. I mean, I see him in all kinds of British movies, uh, even like. Hammer horror films. He's in yes. some of the Hammer horror films. Yes, yes, know? yes. And, uh, and I talk about Roy in the in the book extensively in terms afterwards. of right. He worked. He continued to work with Richard Lester, and he was working on a film with Richard Lester. And he was in a, a horse accident, and he ended up dying. Yeah, and it was and it was quite a scandal. And yeah. I, you know, I talked about this extensively uh, in the book because I thought it was significant because. 
Lester continued to make really interesting films. He continued to work with people that were on the Beatle films. And, you know, Lester is someone who is regarded by a lot of people as a truly great film director, but by some people, they don't, they don't realize the extent of his talent. And I've said this before, because he mostly directed comedies, sometimes he doesn't get the due that he deserves because people think comedies are just, you know, throwaway films or mm. whatever. But like a, a guy like Steve Soderbergh is a, is a huge fan of him. And they actually did a book together where basically Steve just hung out with him for weeks interviewing him. And the book is mostly just a transcription of all of these interviews and Steve talking about what he's kind of working on at the same time. It's really an interesting book. I was able to use it for research and I quoted from it, you know, in my book. Yeah. Well, and also I, I remember I read, just read that a little while ago, 1988, I think around there was that situation with Roy, uh, Roy Kinnear uh, and they were going to stop production. Right. Yeah, I get into this in, in great yeah. depth. It was really was, it was, you know, I tried to talk to people who worked on that film and I, I received, you know, crickets from everybody. Michael York, I believe, is in that film too, mm -hmm. you know, and it was you really, for Richard, it was sort of like he kind of stopped making movies after that. He just felt it, it, it devastated him. Mm. He had indicated that, you know, to work on any film where there would be any sort of action you know, any sort of anything like that. He just, after that, he just couldn't do it. I mean, I think that was, if not the last, one of the last films, I think actually the last thing he did was the Get Back McCartney film, the yeah, concert, the concert film, film, that I think Paul sort of kind of dragged Richard out of re semi-retirement to, to do, you know, which is a, a kind of thing Paul would do to be, to help somebody who was struggling, you know, not that Richard, couldn't make another film but he but he just really just felt like it really was a it was a life-changing uh situation and i had no idea about this until yeah. i started researching yeah. richard lester and you know and roy kinnear and i uncovered this i mean it's, i believe it's been written about before it wasn't the first time it's been written about but it was like you know it was really kind of an eye-opener yeah well <clears throat> Uh, moving on, I just wanted to mention, of course, uh, Eleanor Braun, who I love in the movie. I think she's she's fantastic. Now, I've seen her in other things like Bedazzled and this and that. I didn't realize till you pointed it out. I mean, I just didn't, didn't, get, didn't think of the years. This is a first feature film role, right? Yes, and this, yes. She, yeah. she did other things, but this was a first film, which I never really thought of that when, yeah. I, when I watched the movie. But I, she, I like was, uh, she was part of the... Uh, sort of uh, underground satirical theater that was happening in London at the time, mm. you know, the establishment and, you know, Peter Cook and Dudley Moore and all of those people. And then she continued on in theater and television and making interesting movies. And she became an author. She wrote quite a few books. I mean, she really was a, a very talented, multi-talented person, very intelligent, very creative. I mean, the Beatles really liked working with her because she really was a great actress and she really was somebody who brought a different sort of element to it. You know, she wasn't just like some, you know, flashy actress or whatever. Like she really was somebody with a lot of depth who was really interesting. I mean, she plays, you know, parts of that film, she plays in a very sort of, it's very subtle what she does. It's very different. And the way her character sort of changes in the film, you know, yeah. uh, she, she's quite good. And yes, you will see her, turning up in some in some very interesting films that have dated very well and she winds up being sympathetic to the beatles situation <laughs> yes as it, go, as, yes. As it goes on. And, it, and she was an influence i guess as you know too on paul has always said when he wrote eleanor rigby the name eleanor yeah. just because of her because the way it sounded and you know the whole controversy of there is somebody named eleanor rigby buried in a, yeah. in a cemetery in Liverpool, not far from where the, the summer fete happened. So, you know, right. did Paul make this up or was it, you know, subconscious? I mean, that's another whole story for another day. Sometimes <laughs> things just fit in like that, pieces to the puzzle. Well, um, I remember watching a trailer and uh, for help, and they have at least maybe one, maybe more scenes that are not in the movie, which happens from time to time. And it, 
one of them has George when he's being attacked and he's in this dome thing. Is that his ticker tape machine thing? They have a thing, you know, will John ever live to sleep in his pit? Will George be re reunited with his ticker tape machine? It says in like the thing, like, what the heck? They don't see that in the film. Right. I, of, I don't know. I'm hitting that's this a, thing. That's, a, George is that's a good question. I think I've seen that bit. Yeah. You know, it's so hard when you see these outtakes sometimes, especially they're like some of them don't even have sound. And it's sort of like, OK, what is this? Like, I, you know, I don't even know what to say about it. Yeah. You yeah. know what I mean? It's it's like one of those one of those things. A lot of these things that get cut got cut for a reason. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It had to be. Well, even in A Hard Day's Night, there was this what you call a solo scene with Paul. Right, and the, the showgirl. Right at the da at the dance dance hall. Uh, dance. It's a uh, I think dance it's a thing. place where you go to learn how to dance, dance. I believe. And Richard Lester cut it because he felt that Paul was a little too self conscious as an actor. That because Paul had been so exposed to the theater through Jane Asher and acting, and and you know he was a very sort of creative guy who was really plugged into what was going on in London and all the arts and everything. He, he had a little too much knowledge where the others were more natural, you know? Yeah. Yeah. George, like he does a great job, of course, in that classic scene with the, yes. Telling that guy off, you know, uh, it, it, that scene. And Ringo was just Ringo. It's, it's fantastic. Ringo you is know? Ringo. <laughs> and John, John's pretty good too. But yes. yeah, I always thought Paul to me was a little, little, I don't know, awkward or something. He didn't, Oh, he didn't seem, it didn't seem as natural. He didn't eat or right. something. When I when I watch him in scenes, you know, but um, you know, considering that they, they hard days night, he hadn't done anything before. They're essentially playing themselves, right? Anyway, they were pretty decent, I guess. Or they gave the Beatle feel. That's what they're supposed to do. I mean, we could go into so many questions now, bouncing back to hard days night. I mean, uh, I don't know if that's what you, something you would get into talking about the songs, you know, that weren't used like in the. Uh, Opera House, um, what is it called? La Scala. I'm At the Scala Theater, the, right. Sc the, Scala you can't Theater. do that. Was yeah. Richard Lester cut it, and then it was it was used later on yeah. um, in a different cut of the film. But I mean, I mean, this is what you know with films with albums. There's you're always creating more than you need. I mean, the book you're holding in your hand there, the finished book, is close to about 350 pages with everything with the with the front matter and the bibliography and the index the ma the manuscript that i submitted was closer to 500 pages yeah so <laughs> that's kind of how these things go you know i'm as good because as great as a hard day's night is you know the, the one thing if I'm, gonna, if I'm gonna quibble by a hair that i wish wasn't the case is how they reuse songs Later on in the concert scene, they do I, "If I Fell Again," "I Should Have Known Better Again," and so on. Where there were so many songs they could have, they, they could have used. I don't know how the timing was or what. I mean, they could maybe things we said today during the right the uh, concert from Beatles scene. for Sale, right? Yeah. When 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 they were when they were running ac across again at the end, they used "Can't Buy Me Love" like later on again too when they're trying to rescue Ringo. Yeah. They could use any time at all, any time at all. Right. Like, well, right. you got to do is call, and I'll be there, and you want to get Ringo. <laughs> I don't right. know. I'm thinking Beatle cartoons now in my mind. I guess. Right. I think part of why that's done too is it's it's kind of a a, a cinematic effect. Of Back like repeating something where it yeah. becomes like a theme, and yeah. and and so it gets repeated, and it's like a clue to the audience of of like this is part of the the story we're trying to tell or the narrative. Mm -hmm. It's it's done. It, they do it more loosely, but this is something that you'll see. You know, like th this happens a lot in movies where there's a piece of music that gets repeated at different yeah. times. Because, yeah. And it's it's a cue to tell you something that is tying it together with something else. Well, did you ever see The Graduate? I mean, right. I was just thinking that in my mind. <laughs> you know, the time? Simon and Garfunkel yeah, music. Well, that, yeah, that, that, that instrumental that, thing that's played over and over again. Exactly. That's a perfect. Yeah. It's amazing. My brain is thinking that, and you're reading my well, mind. But, Another yeah. one of your great talents, mm -hmm. mind reader. <laughs> I'm reading yep. your mind. Wait a minute. Yep. Wait a minute. I'm getting six lottery numbers from you. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> okay. And if you if you do that, you're going to split the loot with me. <laughs> well, okay. That's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I'll tell you, I'll, let me write them down. Yes. Write them down. 
go go ahead and and, and write yeah, them down. Right. You know, it's interesting. You mentioned the Simon and Garfunkel when they, when they were doing the, the when they were doing the Graduate. You know, I, they were talking about what are we going to do and what songs. And at one point, you know, Art Garfunkel, I believe it was, said to to Mike Nichols, you know, uh, Paul has a song called Mrs. Robinson. You know, which originally was going to be called Mrs. Roosevelt about mm -hmm. Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's what it was originally about. But then I guess he decided to change it. So again, it's one of these like this, these serendipitous kind of moments. And you know, Simon and Garfunkel, they were one of the first people to really create interesting, different music for a film. I mean, The Graduate is a major breakthrough mm -hmm. film in the '60s, mm -hmm. an American film, obviously. Mm -hmm. You know, so. Interesting. I guess I just think you know, now I'm talking all about Paul Simon. I'm thinking of Joe DiMaggio, the lyrics. He, right. He, he wanted to use something else. Uh, I forget some other ball player. Oh yeah, that, really? I'd say I didn't know that. I know he's a I big Yankees what that fan. Was. I, I can't remember if it was. Oh jeez, who's the other? Oh, who's Mickey Mantle maybe or something? There was somebody he wanted to use and it didn't fit, so he went oh. with Joe DiMaggio. He said, "I remember hearing." I know Joe DiMaggio thing. didn't like it. He felt <laughs> yeah. like he felt yeah. like. What do you mean? Where did you go? I'm right here. I'm yeah, making I'm right Mr. Here. Coffee commercials. Uh, That's what he was doing Mr. Coffee. at the time. Mr. And Coffee, you know, yeah. Paul's a huge baseball fan. I mean, he's a huge Yankee yeah. fan. Ah, yeah. Paul, I'm a Mets guy. All Sorry, right, Paul. well, <laughs> well, I know Paul. The Yankees, the Yankees are the big ones. So, right. Anyway, but already. Uh, so I, I was thinking a question I had for you. Um, I don't know when you would when you were researching all this. Were there and it was anything like a standout, like a revelation? Uh, I don't I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you could think of anything, maybe oh yeah, well that I, that was a surprise. I didn't really know that. That's impressive. Was something that stood out to you? I mean, you know, Yellow Submarine. Like the more you sort of dive into it, the more you realize how many people worked on that film, the animators, and you know how different it was. And the circumstances and how um, the film was, it, well, it was almost not released. There was all kinds of legal problems with it. The producers basically tried to, I, I think it was not Walter Shenson. It was, oh, I can't, I can't remember his name right now. He wrote a book on Yellow Submarine. I'm having a senior moment who the producer was. Um, uh, me too. He wanted to. He I was basically, thinking of the car, the Beatle cartoons. It's not right. Al Brodax. He didn't. <laughs> Brodax. He didn't. Al, Bro, Al Brodax. It is Al Brodax. Al Brodax. Yeah, Al Brodax wanted to take the film away from from the the people who were making it because he felt it was taking too long. It was going over budget. He felt he was running out of money. He couldn't pay anybody. I mean, the film almost was shut down. I mean, the whole story of Yellow Submarine was there was so much about it that I didn't know. And you probably know Dr. Bob Hieronymus, who's written two books on Yellow Submarine. Those books are the definitive books on that film. I mean, he that. interviews so many people who were involved in it. He was involved in the sort of, you know, bringing it back, the, a revival of it. He was involved very much with, you know, George Martin and I mean, his, he's part of the story of Yellow Submarine, him and his team. And his, him and his people were very helpful, uh, you know, when I was doing my research. And, you know, I had to sort of read what he wrote. And then Brodax did this book. And, you know, his book, some of it is not necessarily accurate. And it's, it's more of a question of, you know, if you were there in the 60s, if you remember the 60s, you weren't there. It's, yeah. it's just a memory thing. I think some of it he just got wrong or he forgot. Or sometimes people have a different recollection of things, even though they were there. So it was, I was, it was hard to sort of get it straight because I knew Brodax knew a lot of it because he was there, the day-to-day -day of it. And the hiring of, you know, uh, the, the screenwriters, how many different screenwriters they went through or you know who really wrote this who animated that it's you know it's just i see why uh, dr bob did his books because the detail behind the production of it and you know don't forget these films are not so much about what did the beatles do what did they bring to the movies it's really the director the cinematographer you know the screenwriter the producers, those are the people that are really making the films. 
And that's why in the book, I talk a lot about who they are, who are the people that made these films? What did they do before? What did they do after? You know, did they work again with the Beatles or Richard Lester? So I thought that was important too. And I really got into that a lot and show, look, film is very much a collaborative art. You know, when the Beatles were making their music, I mean, other than George Martin and maybe, you know, Jeff Emmerich or, you know, some of the other people at, at EMI, Abbey Road, you know, the Beatles were the, were the central figures in the, in, the, in the recordings. They wrote the songs, they play on it, you know. But with the films, the Beatles are really more secondary, except, of course, Magical Mystery Tour, because they really produced that themselves. Yeah, oh, yeah, which we haven't really talked about here, but I know you, I'll just plug it out there. There's an interview on, you did on Two Legs with uh, Tom Hanyati and Andy Nichols, where you, we really go into depth about uh, Magical Mystery Tour, if you want to yes. check that out. I believe I Ken was the Michaels, third leg. I was the third leg. You were the right. third. Th- th- <laughs> right. And then you got uh, Ken Michaels Radio. Ken Michaels talked a lot about A Hard Day's Night. I happened to check that out. Well, anyway, I've been talking with Steve Matteo with his fairly new book. <laughs> yes, Act it came out in May. The, the Beatles on Film. Okay. And now... I know you're going to be at the Fest for Beatles fans. That's this weekend. It's February 9th, 10th, and 11th at the TWA Hotel in New York. Um, so you're going to be there. I am sure you're going to be signing copies of your book there. Yes. Pick it up. Um, but otherwise, we'll have a table. Where, where I'll have a table all weekend. Table at there. And, uh, so you can meet him in right. person if you, if you I will get be this. in person, as they as they say. Yeah. yeah. In person, in, in the flesh. And um, on Saturday at 12.15, I will be interviewed by Darren DeVivo of WFUV uh, in the paperback writer room at the, I think they call it, it's either Legends and Villains or Villains and Legends. All I know is I'll be the villain and and, uh, Darren will be the legend. (laughs) <laughs> interviewing them. I don't know. You don't, you don't seem like a villain. But well, I you don't you. know me well, Joe. <laughs> oh, okay. I don't know you well enough yet. All right. Okay. But other than that, uh, if, if if anybody can't make it, where where can they get your book? You can get it on Amazon. Um, Barnes & Noble has a website. Uh, I've seen it in the Barnes & Noble stores uh, here on Long Island. It's in independent record stores also, independent bookstores. You know, it's it's definitely out there. It's very much around wherever you are in the country. I see, you know, uh, on, on when you Google the book in my name, I see it sold at re- uh, record stores and bookstores. I mean, literally all around the world in all different languages. And we were in London last summer, and it was in a number of stores there in London. Um, you know, it's 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 out there. I mean, people seem to seem to know about it and. It's as John Lennon said. It's the usual rubbish, but it doesn't cost much. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's funny. What's that? All all the usual rubbish. You know, I learned some <laughs> new things here. But anyway, thank you very much, Steve, for doing this interview, and I'm looking forward to seeing you at the fest. I'll be there this weekend. Yes, so, that'll uh, be a lot of fun. Thank you I'm so looking, much, Joe. And the weather's with us. We were. I was worried about the weather, but we're going to have good weather. So uh, no snow. So we're we're lucky there. All right, everybody. Thank you for watching. Thanks, Steve. Thank and, you, uh, Joe. Talk to you again soon. I hope. Take yes. care.